um, I will start this meeting. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Kravitz. I'm the board of the Boston BEC. And I also posted in the chat a link if you guys would like to receive AIA credits to please fill out this form. Uh, as people kind of trailer in, uh, I will continue to post uh, that link for you guys to fill out. Uh, in general, we have a couple of announcements. So our November meeting has been pushed to December 6th. Uh, so stay up to date on our website about when to register. It should be up within the next couple of weeks or so. And for today's meeting, I present to you uh, Gil Kostenge. And he has had over 23 years experience as a consultant and in the com commissioning industry working on multiple and various, I should say all facade types um, with forensic investigation, commissioning and building rehab. So without that, uh, Gil, I give you the floor to, for your presentation. Oh, and one more thing. Uh, I ask that we hold all questions to the end and I will read them and uh, we'll just go over them as they come in. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I guess with that, I'd just like to thank the BSA and specifically the Building and Closure Council uh, for asking BES to come and speak today. Um, and thank all of you for attending. I know your time is very valuable and I hope you find this interesting. So with that, I'll just jump right into it. And like Sarah said, if there's any questions or if there's something that you're not understanding, uh, I'm assuming I'm speaking to uh, the audience being commissioning professionals and experienced architects. So if there's something that you quite don't understand, just uh, we'll do our best to answer those questions at the end. So just real quick, a little bit about BES. Um, we're a, a team of very talented professionals, architects, engineers that collaborate. We really uh, focus internally here on a a team collaborative approach to addressing our clients uh, enclosure issues and challenges. Um, you could see on the slide a little bit of uh, the types of client sectors that we service. We have offices in Providence and Boston to service our New England client base. Just a quick uh, overview of the type of enclosure services that we offer from commissioning on new construction projects through you know existing building condition surveys i'm sure a lot of the folks on in this meeting attending are familiar with these types of services um, so i'm not going to get too much more into that but if you have any questions feel free to ask away at the end as far as my experience uh, i've been spent the better part of my career flying around the country, pulling apart buildings, uh, seeing what works and what doesn't work, performing testing both um, in laboratory setting and in the field setting. Um, prior to coming on at BES about two years ago, I worked for materials testing lab. So that's largely my background is more on the material science and engineering side of things. Um, the past 10 years or so, my career has shifted somewhat from more existing building surveys to, which is kind of reactive and solving problems that already happened to something a little bit more on the front end and proactive doing more to try to prevent those problems in commissioning. So I spend a lot of my time researching um, and promoting good building practice and commissioning practices. So a little bit of what we're here to talk about today, I wanted to try to pick a subject that I hadn't really heard talked about much in the industry and the presentations that I've attended or given. Um, this is something a little bit more contemporary. I see it going on just about every day if we're involved either doing the testing or commissioning a project. Um, you know, our, our, our staff comes back from the field and or I'm involved with the project and I hear what they're going through as far as uh, the logistical challenges and just getting field testing performed. And uh, I guess the main thing is, there's just so many things to consider when we're talking about logistics from these four points, starting with identifying the actual logistical challenges that we're faced with. Um, 
leading into you know just understanding what the testing requirements are. That'll help inform what kind of testing is actually going to be performed on the project and what goes into that testing and what kind of logistics you're going to be dealing with. We'll be talking a little bit about the planning process, which is something that I'm seeing more and more with the uh, traction that commissioning is getting in the industry. Just um, sharing some case real world examples and some case studies as, as far as what we see working in the planning process and how to incorporate that since we're talking to architects and commission agents, agents primarily here, uh, how to incorporate that into your specifications and into your commissioning plans. So that way, when it comes time for the execution in the field, things go off without a hitch. So just starting with a real quick definition of logistics, what is it that we're actually talking about? So a detailed coordination of complex operations involving many people, facilities, or supplies. So as you can imagine with any project, um, you know, construction is just fraught with challenges, right? It seems like a nature of the beast. We're constantly bumping into things that maybe weren't um, anticipated or planned and you're having to overcome. And we just find that the better projects uh, usually have one common element. There's a lot of good planning that takes place beforehand. Um, before the building's actually constructed. And um, so just starting with some identifying some field testing logistical challenges that we see just about every day when we go out, go out into the field from you know, unclear testing requirements, maybe things aren't specified um, real clearly. You know, the cost, did the design team and the owner actually anticipate how much everything that was specified or planned for testing, what it was all gonna cost? Or if there's a leak, who's going to pay for it? You know, that's something we bang up against quite often. Construction sequencing is a logistical challenge. Um, you know, showing up to do water testing on a window and maybe the window's not installed yet because it was out of sequence or what have you. Safety issues, you know, making sure we're safe, performing the testing and accessing and documenting. Locations not identified. Water, water's a big one, not having sufficient water pressure or um, manpower to help run that water to get the testing off on time. Power, equipment, union, non-union, who's building the chambers? You know, those questions come up as part of the commissioning process and in meetings. Weather, everybody shows up for testing and then it rains and you send everybody home, right? Now who's paying for that, that wasted day basically? Um, sealant cure times is a big question that comes up often. Cladding's on, cladding's off. You know, should the brick be installed and we're just testing with the weather barrier in place exposed or should everything be installed? Specimen's not ready. And then probably the biggest one is access that we run into the most common, you know. So getting right into it. So some of these buildings you can see like in this example, this is a high rise project with these large fins coming off the building. And, um, you know, what type of access are you going to need? That's something you really want to start thinking about. You might be thinking as an architect or as a commissioning agent, why does this matter to me? Isn't this on the CM, the construction manager or the, the general contractor to coordinate? Well, at the end of the day, it is. But to put them in a position to best succeed, they really need to be educated as to what goes into this testing. You know, so something like this, this scissor lift, um, you know, showing up to the job site and having a dumpster in the way that has to be moved. <laughs> that's what happened here. So that, that you know, wasted some time. Um, maybe coordinating with the general contractor or the CM that, hey, maybe an aerial lift would be better. So that way we can get right up to the glass in between these large fins as opposed to a scissor lift that goes straight up and down. Those things need to be communicated to the CM before we have a show up or you have a show up uh, to commission and test the project. Some of these projects that we work on are, you know, they can only be accessed via rappelling or some getting really creative with the access. Is everybody aware of that? You know, so making sure that that makes its way into the commissioning plan. How are we getting to these areas? Where are they located? Is there an area that we're trying to get some information from the testing that we can get elsewhere that's more easily accessible? 
So that should be considered in a, in a, in a testing plan. This is a recent project. Um, you know, are there overhead hazards? Are we working in a pick or a fly zone of cranes flying overhead? You know, the entire construction team needs to be made aware that, you know, maybe we're going to have somebody out there spraying water, really can't be flying things overhead, and they have to halt the crane operation, or at least be aware of it. That's a pretty major undertaking on a project like this to stop uh, a crane operation, thousands of dollars per day. On this particular project, uh, this was a first the testing crew shows up to perform testing and right where they're supposed to test, there's a, a grounding cable, a power cable, basically right under the area where they're testing. And if you look at that little booth below, um, it's, there's all kinds of electrical cables and things coming out of there. And we, we opted to, we elected to move the test location for that day just to salvage the day. <laughs> so obviously not the most ideal scenario. And that's something that uh, needs to be discussed during the commissioning process and early on in the planning stages. And we'll get into some of that. Interior finishes on or off. The standards tell you they're supposed to be off, right? So you can monitor and witness the water infiltration if it's happening. A lot of times, you know, the team show up and this interior sheetrock already installed, and that's something that can be coordinated early on with the construction manager. Maybe pick a few rooms that are going to be tested and make sure that those finishes stay off. That way, they're not having to uh, remove interior sheetrock and rework materials. The carpenters love that. Or uh, like more recently, we see this quite often. You show up, you go through all the planning meetings, everybody's on the same page, and then a sealant joint's missed on the mock-up. So what do you do? Um, you know, in this particular case, it's pretty clear in the shop drawings that there's supposed to be a small seal between the mullion and the actual window frame. The window installer just missed it. And that could have been prevented by some type of a, you know, pre-inspection before the testing agency shows up. Maybe the commissioning agent and or the architect do a walk and just verify that uh, the mock-up's ready to go for testing. Walk with the CM, that's really important to make sure that the contractors are uh, held liable for anything that's uh, not done. So understanding some of the project and testing requirements it really starts with building code. Um, you know, as a design professional or commissioning agent, you know, knowing where a lot of these standards for testing come from, what goes into the pressures that are going to be used in the field. And that even becomes, that even comes, in my opinion, before the owner's project requirements are even written, the OPR is written. You have to understand what's actually capable on this project site. Just because the owner wants something doesn't mean you're actually going to be able to deliver it if you have building code or something else telling you otherwise. So it really starts with building code in my mind. Um, did you verify the cladding one through five loads, you know, for the roof and then the cladding and components in zone four and five? Um, you know, were those loads incorporated into the construction documents? Is it clear to the testing agency through the specification, through the commissioning plan, exactly what loads to use in the field? Um, oftentimes what we see is some ambiguity in the specifications and or the commissioning plan referring to, you know, test to X percent as it was tested per armor in the lab or something else. We like to see the loads listed right in there. And I know you can't always do it that, you know, directly, but more often than not, it can be done. So I think as if you're listening to this presentation and maybe you're a commissioning professional uh, or an architect, just collaborating and making sure you're on the same page and thinking ahead when this testing's done in the field, what information can we provide in the specs and in the uh, commissioning plan to make sure that the testing agency has uh, to move forward and they know exactly what they need. Just providing really clear submittals, um, looking at the shop drawings, like that last example I showed with the missing sealant joint. Did you do a shop drawing review? Did you compare the shop drawings to the performance mock-up in the lab or in the field before the testing agency shows up? 
it seems like it'd be obvious that that would be performed, but I can tell you uh, sometimes it's not. So manufacturers data and testing reports. There's a lot of good information buried in those submittals when you're setting up for field testing. Make sure you're taking a look at those. So I threw this in here, ASTM E 2813, standard practice for building and closure commissioning. Over the past 23 years, you know, I started out as, as a technician and then kind of moving into project management and general manager of offices and then more into the management side of things. And now I oversee our operations here at BES. And in that evolution, I've kind of monitored over time what's been going on in the industry on a big, big scale. That's what I'm interested in seeing big trends and um, where the industry's headed and trying to stay ahead of that all the time. And what I've noticed is maybe in the first five or 10 years of my career, I spent a lot of time explaining to clients what a building enclosure uh, consultant was, <laughs> what it is we did. There were only about, I don't know, a handful of firms in the country that do what we do, right? And now with IBEC and the BSA and other organizations really promoting commissioning and enclosure uh, performance and what constitutes good performance, the level of awareness has really been raised. The bar has been raised. And you have standards now and guidelines like E2813 and NIBS3 and ASHRAE0 and, and others. Um, and with that, we're seeing a large increase in testing with the awareness of commissioning and the performance uh, the performance testing that's available and owners are demanding it more and more. They're demanding that their buildings prove in practice that they actually perform as they were supposed to be in the design intent. So you'll look at standards like um, 2813 and they have fundamental and what constitutes enhanced commissioning. And you'll see tables like this. You know, this one's just for water, there's a number of other uh, parameters that you can do field performance testing, a laboratory performance testing on. And if you just look at this one table, if you took it just literally and just wrote your commissioning plan and your specs around it, and if you talk to most experienced commissioning professionals, they'd probably tell you the same, you'd have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of testing required for any given building, right? But it's not intended to be that. It's intended to be more of a guide. You're supposed to look at these standards, really evaluate your project as to what you think it needs as the design professional, as the commissioning agent, and making sure that your owner's project requirements are being met, being fulfilled by performing some of this testing. And you incorporate what you need to. But there's a lot of testing listed and what I've been seeing and uh, what I hope it kind of spurs some conversation at the end is maybe what you folks are also seeing so we can collaborate together. I'm seeing a lot of misunderstandings on um, what testing is really required, how much to include, where to include it. So I think there's room in the industry to, to uh, maybe collectively get more educated on what goes into field testing and how to spec it. And again, moving on, here's another chart from 2813 for air. And again, it's the same story. A number of different tests that can be performed. It's up to you as the designer of record, the architect of record, the commissioning agent to uh, determine what's appropriate for your specific project. Again, specifications, who owns what? Some of the better specifications we're seeing now, it's kind of been an evolution with uh, commissioning. And as time goes on, things are becoming more and more standardized. We're th seeing things kind of across the board from client to client or from firm to firm, tightening up, for lack of a better term. Um, I like to see specifications where the roles and responsibilities are clearly called out. And then there's another layer to that. You know, you also have to confirm what's actually in each one of these uh, people or entities contract because just because it's specified here doesn't actually mean that someone owns it, you know? So, but I do like to see that it's very clearly written in the specifications who owns what. 
And then just as important as to who owns what at the beginning of a test, if something leaks or doesn't perform as intended, who owns the cost, who owns the burden for making sure that follow-up tests are performed or whatever has to happen. Um, so again, this is something that as an architect or a designer, you can do on the front end of a project to really facilitate a process six months, a year, maybe even two years down the road, the field testing that's gonna happen. You can help that process go much smoother by having clear specs and your enclosure commissioning professionals and your consultants can help you with that. Pressures. We get into a lot of conversations about what's the appropriate pressure to use in the field. The AMA one third reduction and where that came from. Um, what's another recent one I ran into? Something leaks and oh, maybe we should do a ramped pressure. We should switch to AMA 511 if you know what that is. You know, maybe we should start at two pounds and then go to four and then six and then eight pounds. The pressures in my mind should be clearly specified in these specifications. Um, it can be challenging when you have a lot of different window types to do that. You know, even in an assembly, you might have a fixed window that's tested at eight pounds, 10 pounds per square foot. And I'm assuming everybody generally knows what I'm talking about here. And then you might have an operable window right beside it that only tests at four to six pounds. And then another window that tests at whatever, 12. That could be a challenge to get the exact pressures in the specs all the time, but where possible, try to get them right in the uh, specifications. As far as the planning process, again, it starts with the specifications. We'll get into this a little bit more, issuing a pre-test memorandum, just kind of putting everybody, the project team on notice as to what's expected and what tests are coming up. This pre-test method statement, a little bit more detailed document as far as uh, what tests are gonna be performed and by who and what it takes to get there. And then importantly, having a, a field kickoff meeting, meet with the project team and go over the, the plan before the testing agency shows up and make sure you're all on the same page. So as far as, you know, you might see something like this in a commissioning plan today. Um, just a table or some kind of a matrix outlining all of the tests that are specified. Uh, you might see a little test summary, you know, air leakage testing of fenestrations, field water leakage testing using a chamber, and then the actual test method, something more detailed, telling you exactly what the ASTM standard is, and then maybe a little synopsis as to what, uh, how that test is performed. We like to put something like this together in our commissioning plan. And we go over this with the project team um, during the kickoff meeting before the testing is performed. Design. So if we're talking about planning, you're usually talking about in the commissioning phase, usually during the design and the early construction phase. Another thing we're banging up against um, often on projects where we're maybe called into test and not the commissioning agent is we'll get a request for testing and I'll say, all right, where are you at in the stage of construction? Are you still in design phase? So we can maybe talk about the standards and help influence change to where it needs to be. And they'll say, no, you know, all the windows are in. If you could be out here in two weeks, that would be great. <laughs> you know, well, by then it's too late. Um, you know, it's very reactive. So if you know you're going to have field performance testing performed on a project, get those firms, get the testing agency, get your commissioning agents involved early on. Make sure they're aware of what the project requirements are. The earlier, the better. That's the main takeaway. This is a, um, a memo that actually came from another organization. We issue pre-test memorandums ourselves, but I thought this one was interesting because this one came from the structural engineer of record. And uh, I actually prefer to see these memorandums come from the architect of record, a structural engineer of record to eliminate any ambiguity about what testing is required. What we see a lot of is we'll get a request for testing you know, you issue a proposal. And then the next question that comes out is, you know, well, the project team really doesn't understand the testing and what's involved. Can you issue a, a test plan or some kind of a memorandum? And then 
the testing agency is then asked to basically interpret the specifications on behalf of the project team and demonstrate the testing that's required in a project. I guess that serves some benefit. You know, you are kind of um, vetting out the testing firm to make sure they understand what goes into the testing and the where and the what. But it's also shifting responsibility back on the testing agency, and that's really not where it needs to be. Um, that responsibility really lies with a designer of record, whether it's the architect of record, structural engineer of record. So in this particular instance, the structural engineer of record issued a diagram of the exact um, test apparatus he wanted to see in the loads for ASTM E488 pull testing, which is this test right here. This is a test that's becoming more and more widely um, requested. Larger scale, larger scale curtain walls with um, concrete anchors embedded in concrete. Um, more and more owners, engineers, they wanna see these anchors basically just pulled, poked and prodded before we start hanging heavy curtain walls off of them. So this test is uh, becoming more and more in demand. And in this particular instance, um, the testing really went off without a hitch. We had that memorandum from the structural engineer of record, knew exactly what was being asked of. Um, and in turn, we actually prepared a pretest plan in response to that memorandum saying who was gonna be out there, when we met with the project team beforehand, weeks beforehand, went over the access requirements, the safety requirements. Um, anyway, so the more you can do on the front end of the planning, the better. In the pretest method statement, so this is a little bit more involved document than just a simple one or two page memorandum on maybe one test, maybe you have a high rise with you know, a number of tests, a whole matrix as part of your commissioning plan that has to be performed. So this is really where you want to demonstrate or document what's going to be done in the field. So you come up with this pretest plan, you list out the equipment, and you go over some of the logistics with the project team, and you communicate that to the construction manager or the GC, so that way the superintendents and the project managers can really get ahead of you and prepare accordingly. Most of these CMs want to help. Um, they wanna have that water ready for you. They wanna have the access ready for you. Where I see them getting frustrated is when everyone shows up to do the testing and something wasn't clear and they're having to scramble, you know? Oh, nobody told us that, you know? So again, putting that in the plan and covering it in the plan and in a meeting right up front. A plan might look something like this. This one's redacted, it's actually from a project where you go actually, you actually go over the field testing methods. You know, this one's just sealant pull testing like an ASTM C1521, 1193, what have you. Um, you might see some matrix involved in there where it actually lists out the loads and the locations. You can see the red lines on the right-hand side. That's actually uh, kind of an invitation for the, the project team to respond and say, no, 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 I didn't want that. I wanted this, I wanted it over here then that plan gets revised and it gets incorporated into the commissioning plan. Marked up drawings showing the locations. You know, this is where you wanna start talking about the access requirements. You can see some of these areas up high, highlighted in pink or clouded. Um, you know, the testing agencies having to hang off the building way up here. Well, is there a plan for a swing stage to get us there? Is there a plan for the crane to have a man basket? How is the testing agency getting there or the commissioning agent to inspect the work? So make sure that that's communicated early on in the project, early and often. Sequencing, you may see a plan, something like this. This is a logistical challenge, making sure that the window installation or the ceiling installation, cladding, what have you, is sequenced and that the field testing agency and the commissioning agent understand that sequencing and how it affects their testing plan, making sure that the windows that are supposed to be installed are actually there. Um, a big one we run into is the window may be there, but the sealant cure time, that's a big question we get. What, how much sealant cure time do we need? Is it three days? Can it just be skinned over? Does it need to be seven, 14, 21 days? Um, our response is usually, we usually recommend whatever the sealant manufacturer, manufacturer requires. 
that kind of eliminates any doubt or questions if there's a leak or some issue, we don't come back to this whole conversation of, well, the sealant didn't cure long enough, so on and so forth. That said, that's our blanket recommendation, but it's not unusual because of maybe the construction sequence or schedule that you have to put water on something earlier than what the manufacturer, manufacturer requires. So in those instances, document, 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 document what the recommendation was, what the manufacturer's requirement is. And then if there's an issue, you base your conversation off of that moving forward. But it's not, it's not ideal to be testing uh, before the cure times are met. It just leads into all kinds of other issues. Here's another example of a testing matrix um, that can help kind of either avoid some logistical challenges or, um, you know, just make things run smoother. So something just as simple as, again, listing out all the testing requirements in your commissioning plan, the method, location and frequency, something we've started incorporating more recently, uh, and it's more of a cost savings measure, is um, you'll see that last column, day. So another thing we bang up against, you get a contract, you get a proposal from a testing agency, and it's for one day of testing, right? We're going to do ASTM 1105 all day, <laughs> you know, 2,500 bucks, 3,000 bucks, whatever it is. And then the commissioning plan is not even calling for that. The commissioning plan might be calling for one location for ASTM 1105, you know, spray rack with a chamber. And they may be calling for an AMA 501.2, a hand nozzle test, and that's it, maybe a smaller project. So we've started in our testing matrix, actually trying to coordinate multiple types of testing in a single test day, if we can. And that's been actually a pretty big development because now we're able to get a lot more testing done and a lot less time on site and less mobilizations but it does take some extra effort. You have to understand what goes into the test. You have to communicate with the construction manager and make sure that they're ready for you to jump from maybe a chamber test in the morning to hanging off a lift and doing a hand nozzle test in the afternoon. But that does help save on mobilizations. Cost is another matrix where we actually start getting into cost. Maybe your client's the owner. And uh, you start listing out all of the testing that's specified and that's all based on 2813 and it's in your commissioning plan. And then you get to the cost and the owner says, I don't have money for this. It's not in our budget. Now what? So I think the earlier that you can have those conversations about costs, the better. Um, they're not always had. I can tell you that. This all leads up to a pre-test meeting. You know, this would typically be scheduled by your commissioning agent. Um, you know, the owner, it's, it's helpful to have an owner's rep in attendance, the architect, commissioning agent, maybe any engineering, um, any engineers that need to be involved, a structural engineer of record. It's not common to have them there, but maybe you're getting into some pull testing or uplift testing or something like that, and they need to weigh in. Um, the subcontractors, you, want, you at least want the foreman or whoever's in charge of actually installing the work to be there, to be representing. And then the testing agency. Um, you know, once you're getting ready to do that testing and you have a date in mind early on in the construction or preferably even in the design phase, bring in your testing agency and actually talk to them about what you're trying to do in the field. Uh, they'll help guide you as far as what type of testing is appropriate versus not and, and what's possible. Review the test methods together. Perform a site walk, walk around, inspect the mock-up before the testing and make sure that it's ready to go. That's not always done. You know, it's, so it's something so simple to do, but it, it's often missed. Hazards identification, like going back to that, um, that test location with the crane overhead or electrical hazards. That's a big one. That's really more on the construction manager, but it's really on everyone. Just making sure that we're all looking out for each other and we're safe when we're out there commissioning and testing. Logistics review, how are we gonna access this area? Um, who needs to be involved? So on and so forth. Make sure you do some kind of a, have a checklist or run down everything during this meeting. 
and then confirm the mock-up and the specimens are ready. We've already talked about that quite a bit. As far as field testing execution, I just went right into a couple of case studies. Uh, these are actually pretty recent projects. So if the, any of these are your projects that I'm working or collaborating with you on, just ignore it because I left them as generic, but you may see something familiar. So case study one, and, and these are largely geared towards high rise because uh, these tend to be the more logistics heavy projects uh, with respect to testing. But uh, these, a lot of these principles, the test planning and the meetings, these can be applied to a smaller project. So in this particular case, you can see the range of tests that would include in the commissioning plan from 783 air leakage quantified to get an actual value. 1186 smoke is something that we're seeing used a lot more, IR, so on and so forth. ASTM 1105, you know, I think most of you are familiar with this, your interior pressure chamber, depressurization chamber, and then a spray rack on the outside. I'm a 501. Uh, this is actually incorrectly labeled. 501.1 is dynamic testing with uh, basically a big fan with a spray rack in front of it. And we'll show you an example of that. And then 501.2, which is the hand nozzle test. So 501.1 and 501.2 are just in reverse here. So this is actually um, extracted from a test plan from a commissioning agent that we're working with. And uh, they're doing a nice job with the planning process. And you can see they have this annotated drawing. It's kind of tough to see here, it's small, but every elevation is represented. And everybody, you know, we're all on the same page about what testing has to be performed. And we go through a few rounds of maybe moving an area, trying to get this type of window versus that, so on and so forth, get it finalized. And then we start looking at the logistics. Where's the project located? And come to find out that a couple of the test areas that were selected are right up against these rail tracks, just to the uh, right above this red box, you can see all the rail lines. So as a consequence, we ended up having to move those test areas because they were inaccessible based on the construction sequencing and the, the abutters restrictions basically to be able to access those elevations. So that's something you wanna know early on. That's easily avoidable and we can work that into the plan. When it becomes a problem, when it gets really expensive is when the testing agency shows up and you have to send them home because they realize we can't get to that test area. Somebody should have told us. So getting into 501 and I apologize, I'm not sure how this slide got <laughs> mislabeled but these are all labeled hand nozzle tests, it's not. This is the dynamic test. If you haven't seen it before, it's essentially a large airplane propeller um, you know, that blows water at walls and you run that pressure at whatever specified and it's supposed to simulate a wind-driven rain event. Some of the pros and cons, you can test multiple areas per day with this type of a test method. Um, limitation, it's limited to about 50 feet off the ground. I actually didn't know that when I lined up the testing agency for this test. And some of these areas were up higher, well over 50 feet. We lucked out and I'll show you how we lucked out. It was a mezzanine we were able to work off of, but if you're specifying this test, confirm with your testing agency what the height limitation is. It's actually not based off the lull. It's based off the tether that they run the fan off of. So just be aware of that. You need an operator and you need a lull. They're expensive, it's heavy equipment. You have to set that up. It can be expensive. It's, it's on the upper range of some of the field performance testing that you'll see with maybe the exception of whole building blow door testing with a lot of fans and you know coming in on a Saturday and having a team of people blanking off uh, windows and vents and things like that. But this test, you're probably looking at five to $7,000 per day, You know, maybe more when you consider everyone else everyone else's time that's out there. It's loud, it's very loud. You have to take that into consideration. Um, and then wind and projectiles, which are at really not as much of a factor as you would think with this test, but you do have to be careful about what's around this fan. You don't want anything getting sucked up into this thing. So in this particular instance on this project, we go through all this planning, mark up the drawings, have meetings, relocate test areas because of rail lines, 
go to show up. And it, it just goes to show that you can't plan for everything. In the background here in the white, there's a crane doing a pick for unitized curtain wall exactly where we're supposed to set up the lull. <laughs> and that was communicated to the construction manager and something internally with the construction manager was miscommunicated. What I like about the test plan, what I like about the meetings is it really documents that information transfer happened. So now when we send that testing agency home for the day and they have to come back tomorrow, we know where the bill's going. We know who to allocate that cost to, and we've got the documentation. Without it, it becomes a lot harder to, to sort that out. So the, the plan's really helpful when there's a leak or a problem in identifying responsibilities after the fact. Again, here's the lull that we had to get lined up. So this was weeks in advance of the test, you know, trying to find a lull that will support this load. And this lull operator who's very experienced was actually kind of concerned about even operating this test. He thought maybe with the wind and it would blow the lift back. It ended up being okay, but there's just a lot of logistics surrounding this test that really should be discussed well in advance to make sure everybody's comfortable with it. This is the test in progress. You can see this cord coming down off of the fan. That's that tether I was talking about. That's the restriction for the height of this test not so much the lull. You can get taller, lull, long, taller and longer lulls to get you up to where you need to be, but it's really that tether. In this particular case, um, it was kind of a game day decision. We only found out that day what the height restriction was. Now in the future, when we go to specify this test, we'll know, we'll work around that. But in this case, we were able to work off of this concrete platform, this mezzanine and get to where we needed to be. But had that mezzanine not been there, we might've been out of luck. We might've been sending the test team home, which would not have been good. So just be aware of that as you're getting into that kind of a test. What else? Weather. This test was originally specified for some time, I understand in the summer months, and then with COVID and the COVID pause, it ended up getting pushed back to the point where it was March, where the testing could go off. And then we had that cold spell in March and early spring. And everybody shows up and we're ready to test and it's, it's freezing cold today. The testing ended up going off anyway. It actually provided an opportunity to see how some of these systems perform with ice accumulation, but you also have to account for in your test report, you're supposed to give that statement as to whether or not the testing was affected, so on and so forth. So just be aware, this is a logistical issue. You have to be looking at whether way in advance, what time of year are you planning this testing? Make sure that's accounted for in your testing plan. And even when you're writing the spec, you should be thinking about the schedule way in advance as to when this project may be constructed, what type of testing is feasible, so on and so forth. Hand nozzle test, the 501.2. Again, this is not water dynamic, this is water hand nozzle. Um, you can test many joints and seams in one day. It's, it's, it's the standards really written around fixed products, curtain wall storefronts, and then more and more people are using it to evaluate flashings and waterproofing. It's easy to run. Anybody can do it. Some of the cons access, that's the logistical challenge. You have to actually physically get up to where you're testing. It's not something you can run off of a lull. Same thing with the smoke test. This is actually from a different project. I didn't have a good photo for this case study, but we did run uh, ASTM 1186 smoke testing on this particular project. Um, again, access, you have to get close to the product in order to run this type of test. The big one is um, the smoke does set off fire alarms. We found that out on a project. So if you're gonna be running ASTM 1186 with theatrical smoke, make sure as part of your planning that number one, People understand the test, what goes into it. Number two, um, notifying people in the surrounding area. You know, contractors have come up and said, is the building on fire? And, you know, people start scrambling, no, the building's not on fire. So maybe posting something that some kind of testing's going on with smoke and effect, and it's just harmless theatrical smoke, but just so they're aware. And then lastly, it may take something as going as far as notifying the fire department. And uh, in one particular instance, there was some testing that we were involved with. It was on a uh, university campus. 
and the fire department showed up. They were supposed to have been notified. The people that we were working with did not notify them, and that could have all been avoided, um, you know, as far as the fire department showing up with a simple phone call. So these are things you'll want to work out in your plan and just talking about it well in advance. This is just an elevation shot of that same high-rise lab where the smoke testing was performed, and you can kind of see through the window the pressure chamber that's constructed. It's pressure that's drawn through the window, and then you have to physically get up into place and apply the smoke as the smoke is being drawn through the window. So there's logistical issues there with access, things like that. On the interior side, um, sometimes we see people filling the chamber and pressurizing. So there's logistical challenges there. Again, notifying people around you, so on and so forth. Case study two, another high rise. This one's a federal, federal building. This is where I got that ASTM E488, that pull test example from earlier. Um, it was also some AMA 511 testing, which is basically a, a gutter test, any unitized, if you're familiar with unitized curtain wall, that chicken head and that gutter condition is filled with water just to test the splice joinery and things between the systems. So that testing was performed and then air, air again with smoke, water, and then water with the hand nozzle, the 501.2. So on this project, there was probably eight months to a year's worth of planning ahead of time as far as the testing that was going to be performed, uh, multiple rounds of pre-test plans and test method statements and meetings. Uh, I would say overall, the testing went very well and it was a very logistically challenging project as far as access, getting to these locations, getting water, the appropriate water source, union labor, there were all kinds of things. And we couldn't have done it um, if we had we not done the planning ahead of time. This is an example of some of the access on this project. This is, um, I guess you would call it a specialized scissor lift with an extendable platform in order to get out to the slab edge condition in order to perform that anchor testing. So this is just a photo of uh, a pull test being performed of a curtain wall anchor. Those projecting fins that we were talking about earlier, you know, just maybe something as simple as putting a wand on the end of your Monarch nozzle, your AMA nozzle to get it out there so you can actually physically reach it. And maybe another project down in Connecticut that we were just involved, maybe putting somebody taller on your team on the swing stage so they can physically reach the side of the building. Those are things that should be worked out early. You don't wanna find out on test day. Finally, case study three, another logistical challenge that comes up on some projects. Uh, so this is an airport terminal connector. Uh, this is our, these are all the tests that we're you know, being asked to coordinate or run. This is the bubble gun test, if you're familiar with uh, the bubble gun test for air infiltration at anchors. So again, what kind of logistical challenges here are we dealing with? We're dealing with access. We're dealing with an airport runway. It's active, noise, um, you know, so on and so forth. Cold, if it's, if it's wintertime. This is just a photo of that ASTM E1105 test in progress. You might see something just as simple as taping off or securing the spray rack right to the, right to the lift and craning it up into place. That's a pretty common practice. You just have to make sure that your spray rack is within the distance of that window face is what it was calibrated for and that the pressure being supplied to that rack is what it was calibrated for. So that's gonna be accounted for in your logistics plan. Security clearance is huge. You know, whether it's uh, airport, government projects, schools, you know, that's something that uh, can take a lot of time to work through. Make sure that's part of your logistics planning. Safety, again, active runway, heights, noise, making sure we're all aware of all the safety hazards out there, and then access. On this particular project, this is actually the airport's flow diagram of what it takes to get um, security clearance. And this is something you'll want to talk about early on in your logistics planning. This took months to work out. 
before we ever stepped foot on the runway or performed any testing. So again, try to get your testing agencies involved, try to have that conversation early about what goes into this testing, you know, writing it into your specs, writing it into your plans, meeting with the project team, discussing it as a team, so you get everybody collective and on the same page, and then you go out and test. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. I hope you found it interesting. I tried to pick a topic that I hadn't really heard presented before, um, but something that we're running into quite often, so. Well, thank you, Gail. I have a few questions for you. Um, so shortly after you mentioned the case study one, uh, there was a list of tests that you performed. I don't know if you wanna go back to that slide. Um, but I was just curious as to what were some considerations that kind of influence selecting those tests? Um, yeah. Well, it, it of, oftentimes it starts with the type of the fenestration, if we're talking fenestrations, the type and the exposure that it's going to get. Um, another consideration would be a lot of them are judgment calls really are, what happens if this thing leaks? Is this easy to get to? Is it easy to fix down on the ground level? Is it in a, is it in a common area that maybe if it gets wet, it's really not gonna cause any damage. It's just getting on some aluminum or tile finishes and we could just have somebody come out and replace a gasket or reseal. That might not be as worthy of a testing effort as something that's up on the 30th floor where there's 400 of them in a punched opening that you can never get to again unless you're on a swing stage. And maybe if that condition is repeated over and over, it's gonna be a huge dollar figure to fix. So I would say, yeah, type of fenestration, how much of it is on the project, exposure, um, you know, even just what kind of performance information, performance data do you have? What kind of experience do you have with that product? Is this a unitized curtain wall that you have 15 projects worth of experience on and you can monitor that, um, that fabrication right in the shop? And then it's a matter of just fitting them together in place? Or is this something that's stick built with a lot of moving parts in the field? So there's a lot of considerations as far as, um, you know, what types of tests and where, those are just some of them. Thanks, that helped a lot. I also have another question from Steven. Uh, is there a way to do quantitative air testing on a small portion of unitized curtain wall? In the past, we've had trouble because the mullions run continuously beyond the test specimen, which allows the air to run in and out of the test chamber. Good question. So there's two answers. The simple answer is in the laboratory, yes, you have to have kind of a boundary condition. So that way you're not getting extraneous air. In the field, the answer is generally no, unless you get really creative because of exactly what he just mentioned. You have extraneous air getting into the mullion and then leaking out beyond your chamber. So another way you might be able to do it, depending on the configuration of the curtain wall, is you may be able to do an actual exterior pressure chamber, which gets very difficult because then you have to have a means of mounting that pressure chamber to the wall and either doing a negative or positive pressure. And the only reason why I say that is because on the outside, let's say you have uh, you know, um, a two-sided or a four-sided silicone seal, structural silicone glaze system, um, you can pretty much assume not much air is going to get through that. But you also know that if you mount the chamber to that, you're not going to be getting your extraneous air like you would on the inside with mullions running by. So it's very difficult to get a quanti quantitative air reading, an accurate quantitative air reading on unitized in the field. It's specified often. Um, the testing agency will show up and they'll get ready to test for water and they'll run the blank for air. And then you run the test and you start getting these values on your flow gauge that are just so high that even when you strip the blank, um, you, it's not even a discernible difference. And that's why in a lot of test reports in the field, you either see NA not applicable or immeasurable. 
And it's usually because of extraneous air. There's just so much extraneous air, you can't tell what's coming through the fenestration versus not. Very difficult in the field and ununitized. Thank you. This is very interesting. Thank you and great presentation. Hey, Gil. Yes, this sir. Is, this is Drake. How are you doing? Yeah, I thought I recognized you. How are you, Drake? <laughs> I'm hanging in here. Uh, Gil, I got a general question for you. There are, broadly speaking, two major kinds of testing. The field testing, which you've described here, uh, very nicely done, thank you. And um, then you have lab testing, like Seknowski's place. Um, there is, so there's, there's the pros and cons of, of each, and then there's a potential for overlap. Could you describe some of that? Pros and cons of lab testing versus field testing, and then maybe some overlap between the two, is that? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, well, I mean, for starters, the lab, te lab testing is really where it starts as far as kind of setting the baseline for the expectations for that product or system that you're trying to evaluate. You know, eventually you know, the product that you're specking and eventually that's going to make its way into the field. So for, from a starting point, um, you really need those test reports. There is no replacement for the lab reports in my mind when you're specifying a project, a product. As far as um, benefits of field testing over lab testing, I would say maybe a good example would be stick built products like curtain wall and storefront where in a laboratory on paper, the test report saying it tests at eight and 12 pounds and it can resist the whatever hurricane force wind and all these things that the owners ask about. And then you get in the field and you start finding out just because of either the sequence or the process of installation um, or maybe the tolerances aren't quite what they are in the lab that they're just not able to achieve in the field reliably what you are in the lab. And you'd wanna know that as a specifier, you, you may be okay with um, a product taking somewhat of a downgrade from the lab to the field if it has a number of other characteristics that you want and you're comfortable with the window and where you're putting it. You know, Maybe you have a storefront that on, in paper on, in the lab, it's testing at eight pounds, but you just tested it in the field and you know they're going to have a hard time making eight pounds on that. I've seen it, you know, it just doesn't make it. But on this particular project, I like the look. It's a narrow sight line. I'm sticking it under a huge overhang and we're going to run an air test. And as long as it's relatively airtight, I'm fine with it not being so watertight because it's never going to see a drop of water. Well, that's up to you as a designer of record to make that determination. So I would say that would probably be an example of where the field on the laboratory testing, um, you know, maybe pros and cons or overlap, if, if that's if that's what you call it. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, pretty you much. Um, what, I, what I was wondering is uh, when you do a lab test, you're establishing the parameters for the construction. And when the con, and so the contractor has to be part of that, his field people have to be. Uh, involve the erector for the, the building facade. Those, all those people need to be part of the process, particularly their field people. And um, then, so when you have that done and you've got all of your problems solved or identified and so on, then you go into the field and you build the building and you have your field inspectors who are basically following along and looking for those tricky problem areas, the, the little pinholes that leak uh, terribly. Um, so you're going through all of that. So then the follow-up question is, is there a likelihood that a field test is even going to be required? Um, have you had experience with that kind of thing? So that make sense? it does. So the follow-up to the first part of your question, what we're seeing in an ideal world, yeah, there's a huge benefit on a performance mock-up in a lab. If you can basically verify that the people that are 
uh, attending that test and observing it are actually going to be the ones installing it in the field. That's been the big disconnect I've seen over the years is um, the mock-ups, not so much in the laboratory, but especially standalone mock-ups in the field that are supposed to establish a standard of care and your quality in the field are often treated like, well, we had a couple extra people available and that's who constructed the mock-up. They're not the foreman, they're not the supervisor. If you can verify that the people actually overseeing the work um, are gonna be at that lab testing, I can see a huge benefit. But a lot of times they're not. You know, the people showing up in the lab monitoring the test are not the people constructing in the field. So that's something you might wanna work out you know, during your pre-planning and making sure that the superintendent, the field foreman are at the laboratory and also the ones that are gonna be supervising the work, supervising the work in the field. Um, does that clarify for you? And then the testing that you might need afterwards. As far as testing afterwards, yeah, there's some lab tests that would satisfy not having to do it again in the field. Um, you know, unitized air leakage testing is a good one. You know, just ver verify in the laboratory what the value is that you're specifying and that it's a nice tight window assembly, but knowing it may be challenging to actually do that test in the field. Um, what else? Impact. In, some of the testing is not really feasible to be doing in the field. Impact testing. <laughs> we got some dogs cutting in. Impact testing. Um, you'd want to see that in a laboratory. You're not necessarily going to run impact testing in the field. It's just not feasible or, you know, it's not cost conscience conscious. Um, what else? Uh, this, this is probably a number of examples that I can come up with. But yes, there are plenty of instances where you would run testing in the laboratory and not necessarily have to specify it in the field. And conversely, there may be tests in the field that you may want run that may, maybe weren't run in the laboratory. We have a couple few, a couple more questions. Uh, so relative to AMA 508, is there a consensus in the industry on the significance of the effects of pressure equalization on a rain screen cavity um, on water infiltration? Let me know if you want me to read that again. <laughs> is there consensus on the pressure to apply in a pressure equalized system? Is that? Yes, on a rain screen cavity for water infiltration. I mean, I guess I would have to know what the genesis of the question is. Is there consensus? I mean, there are standards on how to run the test. Um, when you get the submittals and manufacturers are submitting their products for approval, they will list AMA 508 oftentimes as, you know, tested per AMA 508 to these pressures. So let me reiterate the question. Um, on Is there a consensus in the industry on the significance of the effects of pressure equalization? Consensus. That's an interesting question. I don't know. I'd, I'd like to ask some of my peers here if they think there's consensus. <laughs> I see some names here that are uh, pretty involved in this industry and you know I don't Does know anyone want to this consensus chime on in? The used on rain screens. Well, I'll chime in. This is Richard. I was involved in the development of 508 on the committee that originally developed it and um, pressure equalization is hardly ever done correctly. Uh, a lot of the systems that um, do claim pressure equalization require, you know, somebody getting out of there with a metal file and making sure the corners are perfect. I mean, we've TNL tested some of those systems and they, they, they typically to be made to pass required work that's never done in the field. On the other hand, I did custom aluminum plate uh, uh, pressure equalized rain screens that did pass because they're larger scale, the joints are bigger, you can do, you can baffle them better. 
the general thing is I specify I'm a 508 as a belt and suspenders. If you know if you, if they can pass it, it's a better system. But doesn't mean I would uh, re rely on that. I still call for a, a full air and water type backup behind it. So that's uh, that's my answer to that question. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Richard. Um, I, I'd ask that question. This is Ryan. Um, and actually, I, I totally understand where you're coming from because where that question originated is metal plate manufacturers that have AMA 508 testing. Um, they seem pretty proud of it. And I'm just trying to understand, uh, is that something the industry is looking for uh, or not? So, so that was helpful. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ryan. All right, we have one more question and then we'll end our presentation. Well, Sarah, um, Sarah, I had a yeah. question uh, that you somehow skipped over. Or oh. is that, it was, maybe it was because you thought it was a comment, but I think it's a pretty significant one. And that is uh, ASTM, uh, what the one, the ASTM standard for building commissioning, it's just called the standard. And yet we find clients referring to it. And I find a huge misunderstanding on that because they they think it's, it's a, in other words, we're legally liable since it's called a standard. And yet owners casually refer to it, not never realizing that if somebody actually submits a proposal based on doing that scope of work, you will find yourself uh, with a client that will never agree to pay for it. Yeah. So do you, is it your interpretation that, that, that the, uh, that it isn't to be treated as a standard that the, uh, that the thing tests that they list are is a menu of options rather than requirements. No, actually quite the opposite. If, if it's a standard practice, Technically, you should be following it to the letter of the law. It's not a guideline. Mm -hmm. If it were okay. a guideline, if it were a guideline, it would be optional. Well, as but, far as like the lists of tests that I guess you have to perform, right, Richard? Yeah, yeah. Am I yeah. understanding that right? There's yeah. um, a couple slides in the beginning about like that listed a lot, or I should say, all of the commissioning tests that you can possibly do, um, and whether you have to perform all of the commissioning tests or it's an option to perform these commissioning tests as you see fit. And like, is there a difference? Because it does say here are the, you know, standard tests. Yeah. So if you go, we're going back to the slide now, there's an enhanced and a fundamental, right? And if you're doing fundamental and you're following this practice and this is what's specified, for the specification, you're supposed to be following this to the letter of the law for the fundamental requirements. Mm -hmm. That's okay. a lot of testing. I it's know someone who, so who uh, did a proposal for a hospital in Tennessee, I think it was, um, for the per this standard, and the the fee for the building and closure commissioning was three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and most clients will you know walk away from that. And the problem is if you're in a sort of a bidding situation where a lot of the new sort of high performance, like um, trying to get lead standards, lead refers to it, which is the danger. That's where I keep running into it. And they, they don't think it's anything, just a minor, you know, just refer to this standard and we're covered. Well, yeah, but it, then I waste my time doing a proposal and don't get the job. So, and I, I know this is an issue because I, I, I know WAG DNEs who developed this, uh, the uh, original NIBS guideline three, uh, he threw everything but the kitchen sink in it. And then the people who developed the ASTM standard, who also were involved with NIBS and the, the building and closure co uh, the, uh, councils nationwide, um, they had a huge fight over it. They walked away, they quit. I mean, it was really a bad, bad thing because they wanted it to be a useful standard that could be used regularly in the industry and Wagdy didn't want that. And Nibs decided they'd go with Wagdy's approach because it was it was a bigger deal. I don't don't know the reasons why, but I know that they ended up leaving the whole thing, the whole organization because of this argument. And it's still out there. I'm just I, I don't I don't know an easy solution. 
Well, it seems like the path that I see ASTM taking is they're moving more towards standard guidelines as opposed to practice and giving, I guess, the authority or the responsibility, putting that back on the design professional, as I was saying earlier, to determine what's required for this project. But you're absolutely right. If it's listed as a standard practice and that's what's specified, commissioning agents supposed to be following the standard practice 2813, What's interesting about it is there's a lot of testing in here that may not even be applicable to your project. Project, yeah. yeah. You know, there's acoustical requirements, there's all kinds of things in there if you really read it. And that was the first thing that hit me when this came out, whatever, I think it was back in 2012. I looked at it and I said, man, are we really expected to run every one of these tests? This is unbelievable. I'm never, we're lucky to try to get one or two water tests on a building <laughs> approved for five or $10,000. And like you're saying, this could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I'm just uh, warning people if they're been asked to do a proposal, say it, it, it's lead and if you read the, go into, oh, it's lead four point, whatever the, and then you look at this requirement and oops, it mentions ASTM E2813. Well, you better clarify in your proposal that you're you know, make a decision, maybe talk to the uh, requesting agency if they really want that, or can you submit something that just, you know, pro provides part of 280, 2813. Yeah, it's yeah. A, a good and costly clarification to ask. We, we usually handle that in these memos and pretest yeah. method statements. We read through the documents, basically come up with the plan, submit that back to the project team and say, is this really what you want? Where you want it? This is who's gonna be doing it. This is what it costs, you know, and then they make the decision from there. Okay. Well, sorry to take so much time up. No, that's all right. Um, so just a couple of closing announcements before I kind of wrap it up with one more question. Um, so I hope to see everyone at our next meeting. It's December 6th. We're not having one for November. Uh, so we'll meet on December 6th at 4.30 via Zoom as well. And thank you, Gail, for your amazing presentation. We learned a lot, especially for these last couple of questions. I thought it really clarified a lot of our questions. And uh, so the last one is how can manu manufacturers help guide certain tests that can prevent maintenance issues later? For example, revolving doors, breakout force requirements, oh, such as revolving doors, breakout force requirements not being conducted, uh, installed too loose and have premature uh, book folding issues that wouldn't happen if proper testing was done. So I guess perhaps to you or to any other manufacturers in this meeting, are there any other guides or um, tests that can be performed to mitigate maintenance issues? Well, oftentimes that's where your enclosure consultant or your commissioning agent would come in is helping guide the project team and educating them on what tests they should be looking for on the products that they're considering for their project. So, you know, when it comes time for submittals, um, that's really too late. It should be something that's specified as to what tests they're looking for, for the performance requirements for the project. Um, and that helps guide the manufacturers as to aligning products that they have that have been tested. That's what they'll be submitting on for the project. So there's no surprises. But that happens a lot. That happens a lot with um, maybe newer products that are in development um, because the number of tests that you can run on a product, I don't want to say are infinite, but there's so many, especially when you get into different configurations and mold assemblies, you can't possibly run every single test at every single pressure. So it really starts with the specifications, I think, and uh, setting clear expectations with the manufacturers to what you're looking for. And then through the submittal process, making sure there's alignment that they actually provide that testing. And if not, there may be some follow-up testing. If the project's big enough or you have the budget, um, it's not unusual to go back and have a performance mm -hmm. mock-up constructed and have those specific tests run for that project. It happens with high rise all the time, seismic and racking and all kinds of things. All right. Well, thank you. I think that's it from everyone else. 
I think did I miss anything? Nope, we're good. Oh, and one more thing. Um, if you would like to receive AIA credits, I did uh, copy and paste a link to a form for everyone to fill out. And we're getting multiple comments saying, thank you, great presentation. Uh, thank you, appreciate it. Appreciate everybody's okay. time. I hope you got something useful out of it. And uh, I recognize a lot of names and faces on here. So hope to be uh, working with you, collaborating with you again soon. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Uh, we'll Sarah, this is a recorded presentation. So yes. when will we be able to uh, revisit? Uh, I'm not exactly sure the answer to that as um, I will have to follow up with you on that. Okay. I think in the past, perhaps Heather, if you can chime in on what the lead time is, I think it's at least the following month, if not a couple of weeks. Yeah, Sarah, can you hear me? Sorry. Um, usually it gets posted on the BSA website within a week or so. So yeah, uh, keep an eye out for it. It should be up there pretty soon. That's great. As usual, Gil, you had a lot of material to cover. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, thank you. Hope to see you again soon, Drake. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.